Good afternoon and welcome. It is 3 o'clock. It is the 27th day of September 2021. I am the tabletop role-playing game Love Train that is known as the OGGM. And welcome to part two of our deep dive into the rabbit hole of conjecture that is the future of Dungeons & Dragons based upon the announcements that have reached us from the event over the weekend where at the end of the day several Wizards of the Coast luminaries ooh, big word gathered together and hit us over the head with hints and possible spoilers, leaks, ideas of what we can expect in 2002 through 2000 and, I mean 2022 through 2024 from Wizards of Coast including the big announcement about the 50th anniversary edition that they're going to be releasing in 2024. Other than, of course, we know that it's A, backwards compatible, B, both can contain new stuff and contain stuff to appeal to the um, nostalgia players like myself, and C, it may or may not be advanced 5th edition slash 5th edition 5.1 or something else entirely. We don't know what to expect. Other than look for a lot of changes if we have the surveys to go by and more information coming out in 2022. So we are now going deeper and deeper into the realm of conjection and thought experiments. I have no actual facts here. This is all conjecture. This is all ideas and speculation. I do not in any way, shape, or form have any connection with Wizards of the Coast. I do not have, well, I do have a insider who chooses to remain anonymous, but that individual has not contacted me yet regarding this, and I'm sure they couldn't. It, they wouldn't if they could because of, you know, NDA. So going forward, anything I say is just 100% guesswork. I have no basis on reality whatsoever. So let us go down the rabbit hole based upon the four questions that have been brought to me so far regarding this topic. And again, this is 100% guess. So the main four questions that have reached me so far as of 3.30 today. One, why are these so expensive? Because we already see that the first thing we're going to get in 2022 is a huge mega explorers beginner expedition box set containing Tasha's, Xanthers, and the brand new Mordekainen's Mysterious Manifesto of Multiversal Monsters. That's not the name, but I'm going to keep making fun of it. Which is a brand new book containing 320 monsters, 90 of which percent you've seen before. This is going to be at least $80 to $100, if not more. It's a slipcover box set. It's going to come with a DM screen. It's going to come with the three hardback books. So we're looking at each one of those being $40, $50. So, yeah. And going forward, looking at the, just the way the production value of the product based upon which light and based upon what we've seen of Strict Save and so forth. And based upon the fact that Wizards of the Coast has already announced that because of shipping and other issues, the prices of all their product is going to go up by 20% if it has not already. Ask your local friendly local game store, that's just Games and Anime here in Ventura, to tell you more about the subtle price increase. But Wizards of the Coast has increased their prices to order product from them, like Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons product. They are also, of course, making it a lot harder to fulfill orders at your friendly local game store, that's just Games and Anime here in Ventura, because of the shipping issues. Once again, let's remind everybody about the shipping issues. Anything shipping, whether it be from over the seas or here in the USA, is delayed. Is delayed a lot. So if you're expecting something to be on the shelf, those dates are tentative. We already see a delay because this Mordekainen's magnificent mansion of Munsters was supposed to be out for the holidays. It's now been delayed to the box set in late January with the single book coming out. February. Of the other products that have been announced, we all know that they're going to have high price values, which I think is a mistake. Going forward, we know we're going to have to address some severe financial issues 
people are going to have to be struggling with money again. We are, we are on the precipice of a recession. We are, you know, still dealing with COVID. People are not going to want to spend $200 on a D&D book when most of that stuff is available online for free through D&D Wiki and the SRD and stuff like that. Or I can just go on drive through and get, you know, a $4 OSR book that does D20 Fantasy just the same. So there is a high price value for all these products. Is Wizards of the Coast going to price themselves out of existence because they're just making the things too mixed, too expensive. They're raising the cost to retailers, especially friendly local game stores. That's Zest Games is Anime here in Ventura by 20%. And that's probably going to go up again because of the shipping issue. So why make it so expensive? Because Wizards of the Coast believes its target audience has that kind of money. That the nostalgia players have available cash, which is, you know, many of us do. Um, but we're not going to spend 200 bucks on a Wizards of the Coast product. <sighs> Sorry, you've invested too much energy pushing us away and not enough energy in trying to bring us back. So I think it's generally believed that most of the OSR nostalgia players are not going to be giving Wizards of the Coast any money, no matter what they do, unless they come to us hat, hat in hand with a major butt kicking, bus kissing level of apology. So if they're thinking that's who's going to the money's going to come from, that's not it. So that leaves their next target audience with these younger, newer players, the post-critical role players, the fifth edition players. And again, these are individuals who are not in the financial position to be spending 200 bucks on a product. Most of the streamers are going to get the products for cheap or free. So if you're thinking the, holi the, ho the Hollywood purchaser gamers and the streamer gamers are your revenue, again, Wizards of the Coast, you need to remember that if... I don't know who's a D and D product. Bob, the D and D product builder, is if he's going to be reviewing a copy of Mordekainen's magnificent multiversal cookbook of monsters, he probably received it from you for free or discounted in exchange for doing the review. So again, where is this money for this high price point products coming from? Because it's not coming from your nostalgia boy purchasers like myself and it's probably not coming from your younger purchasers because they just aren't going to have that available money and if you're expecting mommy and daddy to buy little billy the three books box set slip cover with a dm screen when two of those books they probably already have and both of those books they can also find entirely online and by that i do not mean pirating i mean all that information is available on slights like D, D wiki D, D srd roll 20 and D, D beyond so there's really no reason for me to buy it if that stuff's already available for free which moves us to our next question how is this going to affect D, D beyond they have hinted that a huge chunk of the future is going to be digital that's inevitable though there is a small school of thought that says it might go actually the completely different way that the more digital they make tabletop role-playing the more we might see a Luddite movement of people wanting to return to playing at the table, return to having physical games, return to not wanting, you know, everything on the computer and actually be able to have a game in front of friends and have physical product and getting away from the digital crush. Inevitably, there's no way of knowing, but obviously the digital environment is an aspect of the hobby going forward. Wizards of the Coast currently... I, under their parent company Hasbro, has no say directly in what goes on in D&D Beyond. And D&D Beyond has already said, okay, there's certain content we're not going to support anymore, like the playtest content. Now, even if you go on D&D Beyond, you still have to pay money for the digital product. And the digital product usually is not released at the exact same time as the physical product. You see a physical book, PDF book, and then you'll see the digital product in D&D Beyond come down anywhere from a week to a month to way farther than that later. So how will this affect D&D Beyond? Because Hasbro doesn't own D&D Beyond. It's a separate company. Hasbro could continue to work with D&D Beyond, could continue to make the product available digitally to D&D Beyond at that delayed time frame, 
Or they could just say, you know what, we're going to make our own. We've already created this digital marketing, digital environment, digital program for there's already an entire digital aspect to Wizards of the Coast. They just announced they're revitalizing and reactivating their video game um, um, component. And, and it is part of the stru new structure that is the video game digital content program is exactly the same program that is uh, Wizards of the Coast. In fact, it's called now Wizards and Digital. So they could just say, you know what? We're ending our deal with you, D&D Beyond, because we're going to make our own. Keep all the money in-house. That way we don't have to share anything with you and we don't lose any profit. That's what I would do. It's an asshole thing to do, but it's what I would do. And it could be what Hasbro does, but again, remember, nothing Hasbro, Wizards of the Coast does make sense. So in regards to how this will affect D&D Beyond, I don't know. I would say don't expect it to change, at least right away. If new content comes out today, physical, new content will be available on D&D Beyond anywhere between two weeks to two months after that, and you're probably going to have to pay for it. How much? If the prices of D&D Beyond remain the same as they do are now, it's going to cost you, you know, 20 bucks, 25 bucks, $22 to get the digital content for Fizzbins or Mordekainen's magnificent lunchbox of Munsters or Tasha's. But going forward into 2024, will Wizards of the Coast maintain their relationship with D&D Beyond or will they just cut the cord and design their own in-house digital program? I don't know. I don't know. I would say it's bad business to cut that cord and leave the D&D Beyond players tangling. But it's good business to keep everything in-house because then you have complete control over all the profit. You don't have to share any money. So if Wizards of the Coast did cut ties with D&D Beyond and create their own digital empire, that would be the reason why. Financially, it makes more sense. But it would cost them a lot of fans. Or it might not. Especially if they make the new content, their, their digital backwards compatible with D&D Beyond. But right now, I would just say D&D Beyond is probably okay. It's probably going to be okay for at least another year to two years. I don't see them making changes to the relationship, but they could. So if you're concerned about how the, all these new announcements are going to affect D&D Beyond, I think D&D Beyond is going to maintain their current uh, steerage. No more unofficial content. We're only doing official content. This is the content you get for free that will occasionally be upgraded as you know time progresses. And then if you want the Strixhaven or whatever, you're going to have to pay for it. Question number three, and I'm switching these. What is the rest of the industry going to do based upon the announcements? And what are the rest of the industry going to do now that they have a, some idea of what Wizards going, the Coast is going to do for 2024? And remember, we still don't really know what it is, this new core set that we're going to get in 2024. We just know we're going to get a new core set. It will be either 5.1.5, completely revised, backwards compatible, with all the old stuff, as well as all the changes that we're going to see post surveys, if they in fact actually pay attention to the surveys. And of course, this being Wizards of the Coast, we have no idea whether they will or not. They may just ignore the surveys and do what they want. They've done that before. So take anything that they say about surveys and listening to you with a grain of salt. But the industry now knows that 2024, there is going to be a change, a change in the Dungeons and Dragons dichotomy paradigm. They don't know what it is, but they know it's changed. So all the other industries, both the uh, people who, you know, try and make D&D 5E adjacent, D&D 5E approved, or just want to hang on to the 5E engine and you know 
say it's based upon the award-winning world's most popular role-playing game, 5th edition, but this is a space game or a superhero game or a game about monsters fighting giant sandwiches. But now we've been told to expect a major change, and we've got some hints, and we're going to get some more hints. We could pull a Roger Corman and make a cheap knockoff ahead of the actual product to try and milk the market before Wizards of the Coast makes it. So we make our own fifth edition adjacent based changes thing. I mean, there already is one coming out from EM Publishing called 5E Evolved. So I think we could see the fifth edition fan base of publishers do things like that. You know, jump on that. Let's beat them to the punch bandwagon. We know this is being made. We can make the same thing quicker, cheaper, and just try and get it out there and try and milk as much money off of that as we can before it actually comes out, since we don't really know what to expect. But of course, we won't really know anything to the next announcement, which probably won't be till next year. And again, it's really hard to predict, but based upon the way the industry works and what we've seen in the past, I would expect we'd see something similar to that. And finally, the final question, and this is a topic we have addressed before. Going forward, I will be talking about critical role, which means, you know, I'm probably going to say something less than positive because we know I am not a fan of critical role. So if me saying nasty things about critical role is something that might upset you, please stop viewing now. I'll give you a second. How will this affect Critical Role? What is Critical Role going to do going forward now that we know some idea of what Wizards of the Coast plan? Noticeable in their absence from this weekend's event, any member of Critical Role or any member of the Critical Role adjacent fan club like Genie D. In fact, the only individual who's even somewhat connected to Critical Role who, that was there was Mark Holmes. But other than that, the Critical Role crowd were not present. Does this mean something? I don't know. The way I see it, Critical Role has two possibilities. We know they're starting a new campaign sometime maybe in October. And we know that Critical Role has created their own publishing company. They've already published two products, one of which was a total failure, the other one which we're still waiting to see, and we know they have a role-playing game coming down the pike, which, if it's not on the shelves already, should be on the shelves by the end of the year. So Critical Role has two possible scenarios. And again, I don't know. I do not know. I'm just guessing. Just guessing. Scenario number one, they maintain their relationship with, Fifth, with Wizards of the Coast and do absolutely nothing. Wizards of the Coast will continue to shill them. They'll continue to shill for Wizards of the Coast. We'll see them doing Wizards of the Coast-based stuff. We'll see them doing the exact same thing we've seen them doing since they jumped to 5th edition. There'll be no changes whatsoever, and they might or might not be somehow involved with whatever the media is for the 2024 production. That's one. That is the safe choice. The other choice, which is the critical role in company and Matt Mercer and company could make, is to jump ship. They have their own production company. They have a multi-million, well, I don't know, multi-million dollar, but they definitely have a money-making empire in place. They have a fan base in place. They have influence in the tabletop role-playing game industry. They are enough of a name now that they could pull a peso and just jump ship. Completely cut their ties from Wizards of the Coast, create their own role-playing game. They have their own publishing company. They have enough experience amongst them to do this. They're pretty much already playing their own game anyways. I mean, if you watch the actual show, it really is D20 Critical Role not D20 D&D. &D. They're just using the D20 rules that we all know and love. It would not be that much of an effort for them to completely jump ship and 
they might lose some fan base, but the fan base that they have are fans of them because of who they are, not because of Dungeons and Dragons, but the way they play it. So if they played anything else to the same level they can, are playing Dungeons and Dragons, chances are the fan base would remain. Financially, if I'm Critical Role, the second choice makes sense because I now have complete and utter control over my IP. I don't have to share it with Wizards of the Coast. I don't have to share it with D&D Beyond. I don't have to share it with anybody else. Anything that Mercer creates is 100% his. Any money that Mercer creates would 100% go back to him, go back to the Critical Role family. They wouldn't have to pay licensing. They wouldn't have to shill for D&D Beyond. Any sponsors they take would be of their own free will and not because of their association with Dungeons & Dragons. All the ammunition is in place for them to do this. The only thing stopping them is that their first product wasn't very successful. And how will the Critical Role fan base react if they cut tail and run? And how will it affect the industry? If Critical Role makes their own role-playing game and pushes it with the same level of media savvy that they have managed to manipulate their show into the public face, it could be a devastating blow to Wizards of the Coast. A huge chunk of the fan base could Pied Piper follow them, leaving D&D behind, especially if the changes in D&D 2024 are so drastic that all the stuff people think they love about D&D isn't there. They might go, well, you just you just pulled a fourth edition on me. You just pulled a peso on me. I'm going to follow what I know and love, which is the production that Matt Mercer and his crew have made they've got their own game if i'm going to spend something on a hobby that i love i'm going to spend it on them because i want to support that i don't want to support you wizards of the coast it it the ammunition is there everything is in place for critical role to cut the umbilical cord and jump ship and from a net financial point of view it makes total sense because again they would have total control of their ip they wouldn't have to share with wizards. Any money they make would be 100% theirs. But so far, their first foray into self-publishing was a total failure. And we don't know how the fan base will react if they jump ship. Will the fan base remain loyal to Wizards of the Coast? Or will the fan base follow them? And if the fan base follows them, that leaves Wizards of the Coast up a creek because so much of their choices are based upon the belief that the critical role fan base is their target audience those are the people that have been spending money and those are the people that are continue to spend money even as the prices hike up 20 percent or more because critical role made them a lot of money between 2018 and 2020 they assume that they're going to continue to make that money but if Critical Role jumps ship and the fan base follows them, there's not going to be that crowd of people who are willing to spend $200 for a book if they're going to get what they want from Mercer and company who have now moved over there, which would require a drastic rethinking on their part because now they have this 2024 production of Dungeons & Dragons that is completely different than what we see now. If we go by the surveys and anyways, and of course, we don't know if they're actually going to pay attention to the surveys because they haven't in the past. But whatever we see in 2024, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons 5.1 and a half electric boogaloo is going to be so drastically different from what I have now, the player's handbook, because of the post Tasha nonsense. That. It is unrecognizable enough that other than it being called Dungeons and Dragons, it really isn't Dungeons and Dragons anymore. It's Wizards of the Coast D20 Fantasy. But if that fan base who they think they've directed it towards leaves, what do they do? Because now they have a product that they can't really sell and they have a bunch of objects at price points that are way too high to support them. And that fan base that might have, might have spent... 150 bucks on a 
product of gaming is now spending that 150 bucks over in the critical role bank which would just devastate them similar to the tail end of fourth edition where suddenly they have a product and no audience conjecture probably the same thing that happened to fourth would happen to D&D they would just sort of let it peter out they'd refocus on something that they know is going to make them money to cover the losses like board games like they did in the tail end of fourth after the financial disaster that fourth edition was and then we'd see something else in two to five years D D 5.6.8 i don't know if critical role jumps ship it could be devastating for wizards of the coast but I have no way of knowing what Critical Role's plans are, if any, because I don't talk to any of them. So this is, again, only conjecture. And I've wasted way too much of your time talking about it. But there's obviously only two... Po well, I mean, there could be another scenario I'm not seeing. But the two main scenarios are Critical Role stays loyal, nothing changes. Or Critical Role jumps ship and everything changes. The same with the D&D Beyond question. D&D Beyond either remains completely the same as it is, nothing changes, or D&D Beyond is just slashed and burned because Wizards of the Coast creates their own digital program similar to D&D Beyond, leaving the D&D Beyond basically pointless, and either the fan base will follow to Wizards of the Coast or just go, screw you, I'm going to use the free shit. So those are our four questions, and those are my conjectured answers. Again, I have no actual facts. I have no insight. I have no idea what, in fact, any of these individuals have planned. I am just guessing. What is the price? Why is the price point so high? Wizards of the Coast thinks the money's there. How is this going to affect D&D Beyond? I don't know. How is this going to affect the rest of the industry? If the industry follows suit to what we've seen the industry do previously, we will see a lot of attempts to create a 5th edition 5.1 2024 product before the actual product comes out. I mean, you know, when Star Wars came out, we saw a lot of Star Warriors <laughs> and a lot of Star Wars ripoffs before, during, and after Star Wars came out. So think that. Think we will see cheap knockoffs come out before during and after the 2024 and finally our fourth question what will critical role do and again i don't know but the way i see it there's only one of two possibilities they remain loyal to wizards of the coast nothing changes or they jump ship create their own product and everything changes Thank you for listening to me blabber on for half an hour. I hope I didn't bore you. I hope you appreciate this conjecture. If you want to see me go do this some more on other products, please let me know. If you never want to see me do this ever again, let me know. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. Help me hit 1,000 subs. Till next time, that's it for me today. Enjoy the day wherever you are. Hug your pet. Say hi to your mom, have a nice dinner, and stay off my land. I am the tabletop role-playing game love train that is the OGGM. I will talk to you later.